It's my pleasure to welcome Peter to the podcast. Peter, um, no, I'm not going to read from your LinkedIn. I want to let you just just introduce yourself for about a minute or so. Who are you? I'll start with the personal version in 30 seconds. Most importantly, I'm dad to a six-year-old named Quentin, married to an amazing woman from South America named Coney. Uh, have amazing family I'm from Kansas, lived in South America most of my life. Professionally, I generally say I wear three hats. I do consulting with CEOs who are trying to grow their revenue uh, with some truly uh, return on investment backed kind of evidence. Uh, I work as VP of marketing for a healthcare software company, and I am a TV host. So I have a TV show, a cultural program in South America. Okay, so, well, that's a full load of everything, but I, I love the fact that you started with the most important part, that you have uh, a six-year-old daughter and an amazing wife. That's really what matters, right? The rest falls into place. Um, so, I, look, we're both on Growth Mentor. I think you started when, when Forty founded it, right? Like four years ago? I think so. I joined as a mentee. I had picked up the new healthcare job and I had a lot of experience in uh, B2, B2C world, starting travel companies in South America when I was young, but didn't have experience in B2B SaaS service, software as a service. And I needed to scale up from zero to a hundred in four weeks. So I gr joined Growth Mentor. And I remember when I interviewed Foti, uh, cause I felt like I was interviewing him cause I thought it was such an amazing idea and so inexpensive. I thought it was a scam. <laughs> and then I became a mentor about two, two months afterwards and tried to give back to all the mentors who'd given me a lot of value. Yeah. So for, for people that don't know, cause I mentioned growth mentor all the time, but growth mentor is a, a platform that started by 40 and I will never be able to, do you know how to pronounce his last name? Because that makes you special. I can't. No, but I'm, I think Foti's unique enough, at least for those of us who live in the US, uh, that yeah, Foti's Foti, right? Yeah, Foti is Foti and the rest of it is Panatidagagas, whatever the Greek thing is, whatever it is. Um, so he started this company, uh, um, in, I guess it's based in Athens, but it's a platform uh, that combines, I think we're up to 500 mentors who are specialists primarily in growth marketing, all aspects of marketing, but also about founding, you know, uh, fundraising, mindset, culture, management, leadership. There's about 500 people that 40 vets himself. And uh, it's sort of like a subscription service. So individuals or company pay a service to have access to us and we give of our time freely and happily. So, so that's that's growth mentor for those who are not familiar with it. So, um, you're a fascinating guy, man. Uh, I'm looking at some of the notes, right? Adventure seeking, marathoner, TV host, pro podcaster, professor of international relationship, chili guru, not the beans, but the country. Uh, and a marketing guy. So what what I like to do, at least in 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 my podcast, is is really sort of like peel the onion and then we get to what you do today, primarily the long long term care stuff. But let's go back to when you were a teenager and I bumped into you somewhere and I said, Peter, what do you want to be when you grow up? And and it's an interesting question for me with a guy like you, because uh what you've done after that is pretty incredible. So do you know what the answer was? Yeah, I wanted to be an attorney probably from the age of, I'd guess, nine or 10 until about 17 or 18. And I don't know why I wanted to be other than I think a whole bunch of people told me they thought I'd be good at an attorney. I'd be an attorney and they and I, the the people from my small town in Kansas uh, that I knew that were attorneys were just very smart and very charismatic. So I kind of fit those two things together. But I can remember very specifically the day that my dad told me never to be an attorney. And he said, I don't know any attorneys who love their job or love their life. And my dad was the most important person in my life uh, as a friend, as a mentor. 
and his words uh i didn't i don't think i said anything other than other than the why and with that i knew immediately i didn't want to be an attorney and so from about 18 till 25 i wanted to be a diplomat and that's why i ended up going to chile to study my master's degree and then when i started my master's degree in south america at kind of a diplomatic school or a trampoline uh, for a stepping stone for Chilean diplomats. I realized I didn't want to be a diplomat because I didn't know very many diplomats who enjoyed their job or their life. And I quickly pivoted to an entrepreneur where I started uh, a company about a, about a year or two afterwards. And then since then, I'm still trying to figure out who who I want to be and what I want to do when I grow up. Well, uh, you'll figure it out soon enough because you have a six-year-old that's waiting to ask you a question at some point. Um, so what, so, so it, it, it's a big world, right? So if you want to be, so we, we, and your dad is so smart. I want to hug him for the world doesn't need another lawyer. Uh, and he's right. Cause my best friend, literally my closest friend is an attorney who quit law and in, in his world, he's a phenomenal, amazing human being. Um, he could not stand making a living sitting across from an adversary, realizing that their attorney or them are making the biggest mistake of their lives, and they could, he could not say a word. Uh, he literally could not sleep at night, so he quit. He literally called Turkey, walked out of law, and, and never practiced again. Um, and, and I met him years later in the company that I, I was running, and I, I, I trained him as a sales guy. And he was phenomenal because he's a people-loving guy. And mm-hmm. everybody loves him. So, um, so here's the thing. Uh, it's it's a big universe. What was your attraction with Spanish? You picked Spanish in college. What was that? Mm-hmm. I went to a boarding high school in kind of central Missouri, and at that school in 1994 to 98. Of the 160 students, more or less, so 40 freshmen, 40 sophomore, 40 juniors, 40 seniors, about 30 to 40 percent of the school were international students because it was affordable, the education was amazing, and because it had a dorm. And my best friends were international students from day one, and one of my best friends was from Spain. And I realized at the age, I wasn't able to say this, what I'm going to say now, but I was aware of it. Learning a language is learning a different paradigm. It's a different framework. It's a different logic of thinking. And every single time those people shared part, they tried to translate part of their framework from their native language into English, I realized they were teaching me something. And there was a percentage of what they were trying to translate I was missing because I didn't speak their framework. And I was going to say that that particularly in... I'm originally from Israel, so I'm a foreigner, even though I'm fully a full bl- full blown Yankee by now after thirty something years. Um, but there's one thing about American culture and American especially is they they don't speak another language. We always make fun of the French who don't want to speak anything but French. But for the most part, Americans just I mean, my kids took Italian and Spanish in school. They don't remember a word they learn, and they have no motivation to use it. Uh, mm-hmm. so it's, it's sort of admirable. Maybe that happens in, in Kansas, <laughs> what, uh, where this was your attraction. And it's interesting. I came to go to college from Israel, literally two weeks after three plus years military service, walked into a very small school. Uh, and I was the main attraction because they've never met. I mean, they, we had foreign students and it was like, oh my God, like who is this guy? I mean, Israel is well known, but still it was so I I can relate to your infatuation with what that language represents. It's not just the way you speak. There's a whole universe of culture and thinking and traditions that comes with it that we take for granted. I mean, interestingly, I spoke five languages in my youths. <laughs> um Hebrew in Israel, English is the second language which was taught in school. My parents uh, spoke Polish to each other. We had a tenant in our apartment building who lived with us who was German, spoke nothing but German. And in high school, you have to pick up high school in Israel, like 
it's like college here. You pick a major. And I was a math major, worked too hard and looked at all my friends playing outside after school and dating girls. And so I switched from math to languages and I picked French um, and was was lucky to travel the world in, in the corporate world as, as part of my career. And it was fascinating. Um, so so we get the, the, the Spanish thing um, and then you finish college and what happens next? My first job out of college is I became an HIV AIDS caseworker because I spoke Spanish with the homeless population in Boston. I was working, I was, I was a very good student undergrad and was a TA all three years in college. And, and my professor of sociology hired me to do some research work right when I got out of college. And shortly thereafter, I get a call and I, I remember it really, really, very distinctly. And, and the person who called me, his name was Marcel. And he said, Peter, I heard you speak Spanish. And I said, yes. And he started speaking to me in Spanish. And he said, uh, would you have any interest in working uh, as a caseworker? And I said, sure. I studied sociology. I volunteered many, many times. He goes, do you know anything about the homeless population? I said, not much. I interacted with them, but I'm from rural Kansas. We don't have homeless people in my hometown. And he said, do you know anything about HIV or AIDS? And I said, no. And he says, would you be afraid to work with it? I said, no. And he invited me in. And that was kind of a life-changing job for me. It was one of my best jobs I've ever had. I always have done a lot of public speaking. And I usually say that two things that I've learned the most from professionally was working as uh, a bilingual HIV AIDS caseworker with the homeless population. Number two is working as a certified nurse's aide in nursing homes. And those two are very fulfilling. What was it about working with HIV AIDS homeless people that kind of resonated with you so much? I think what I learned from it is that if you work hard as a human being to connect with others and work hard to understand them. It doesn't matter that you're a white Anglo-Saxon uh, male from, from the Midwest that has absolutely nothing in common with the illegal Honduran immigrant that I'm trying to help to get services that's using an illegal social security number and I'm helping them get a bed so they can sleep on and they're pregnant and I'm trying to get them to the doctor. The, that that difference between me and her really, really doesn't matter if she feels connected and understood. So I learned a lot from that principle. And as a marketer, I always say that if you can figure those two things out, uh, the rest is easy. The rest is tactical. But if you start high and you go up there, that, that's the starting point. And I would say probably what, what I felt like it gave back so much was they didn't feel discriminated upon by their own people. So they felt comfortable speaking to someone who wasn't in their village, who didn't look like them, who spoke with an accent. Uh, and once I realized that that was my advantage, uh, I realized that there wasn't anything holding me back from connecting and understanding others. Hmm. Amazing. And, and I like how you related to what I think we do in marketing and and that's the the greatest misconception, particularly as marketing becomes more techy uh, and there are all these shiny objects and all these applications that that you can press and magically things happen, which you and I know it doesn't work that way. Uh, but the piece that everybody misses is that behind every customer, behind every lead, there's a human being, there's a living, breathing human being, and, and your ability to truly understand and connect with them is what makes for good marketing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we even, we even, I don't know, whenever, whoever came up with personas as a term, it's a technical term for marketing. I, I kind of always refer to it as the, you know, you're, you're a CSI investigator, crime scene investigator, and your job is to put together the, the profile of the person that committed the crime, right? That's what we do in marketing, mm -hmm. persona thing. But it, everybody falls into, uh, I'm older than you, but when I worked for an ad agency many, many years ago, the way we used to segment the population was 22 to 80 males, right? There was, <laughs> that was it, right? The universe was, okay, you're the male, you're a female, young, old, and maybe some other things. And today we we can dive into 
you know, atomic components of, of the people we're trying to serve, but we lose, but we lose touch with the fact that they're people, right? It's like, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. Do the persona thing, do your segmentation, do all the stuff you need to do. But the, it starts with, do you truly understand your target audience? I mean, really understand them, not just think you do. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't want to read from 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 LinkedIn, but can you run through? Because you've done some really cool stuff. Um, so you so you went to you 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 got into Spanish with your roommate, right? Then at some point you decide to go and you spend you travel ten countries, but over what time? What time frame? So I perfected my Spanish in Costa Rica. Uh, dated my Spanish teacher there. And while I was there, uh, I took a, I backpacked in a bus from Costa Rica to Mexico and then back when I was 19 uh, and then went to Costa Rica again when I was 20. And when I was 22 years old, I applied for a scholarship through Rotary Club uh, to go study my master's degree anywhere in the world. At that time, uh, I wanted to be a diplomat. So I had already backpacked through South America and I visited Chile and happened to be in Chile. Actually, right now I'm talking to you from the south of Chile in the same city I was in, in Chile in 20 uh, in 2020. And at that point, I realized I wanted to come back and live in Chile for a good part of my life. So when I won the scholarship, I knew that I wanted to go back to Chile and I applied to the University of Chile and I ended up down here um, studying my master's graduated number one, became a professor at the University of Chile uh, in, in the 10-year route and thought I was going to be an academic. And uh, since then, I've still been in midlife crisis. <laughs> so so your Spanish was fairly good if you just went to school there. I would say that it is very good because this Chilean Spanish is it's borderline not Spanish. It's really hard to understand uh, the slang and the way they pronounce everything. So I thought I spoke Spanish showing up here and I didn't, uh, or not Chilean Spanish. I had to record, I had to take a voice recorder to my classes and record the professors because I couldn't understand their Spanish. And then I'd go back and listen to it in 1.5x one, 1. or 2x, take down notes and learn that way. That's pretty funny. because And I came here to go to school and I spoke English pretty well, but I went right to college. And I remember I brought with me from Israel the English Hebrew Dictionary. Uh, so this was late 80s, right? It was it was this big. It was mm -hmm. huge. And I would take and and I would read and I see words that I didn't understand. And I would circle them and go back to the room and open this giant dictionary. Same kind of process. But so it's interesting because um, I don't speak Spanish and I, I'm I'm still eager to speak it because I love the culture and I love to speak the language. I know how to curse in Spanish, but that's terrible. Um, but there are different dialects. Right? So Spanish in Spain is different than Spanish in Puerto Rico and Mexico. And now you're saying Chilean Spanish is completely different. Yeah, very much so. And Chilean Spanish is, uh, I would say, really close to a cultural Spanish because the, the Chilean like I would say that the Chilean potential or max usage of the Spanish language has to be the most limited amount of Spanish of any country I've ever been to. So let's just say in Spain, out of a thousand words that exist in the Spanish dictionary, the Spaniards use 850. And let's say Costa Ricans use 845. I'd say Chileans use 150. And so you have to pick up on lots and lots of tones because they use the same word over and over and over to mean different things. Wow. It's amazing. So, so I have a look. We, we, I, most of the people that I'm actually speaking with, particularly through Growth Mentor, uh, they're nomads. Like a lot of them just leave their home country. They go live in Spain. They go to Portugal. They get bored. They move to Mexico. Then they go to Bali. Uh, I'm totally, totally jealous of. I wish I could have done it or would have done it. Uh, or if I had to do it again, I would. So we talk about somebody that decides to go live in another country and say, okay, that's nice. Well, I know what it's like. I came here, but it's not exactly the same. You don't look, you don't look like the average Chilean, right? 
I can't tell. I can't tell if you're a tall guy, but but you might. Be. Yeah, I'm pretty. T- I'm I'm pretty tall. I'm about six foot, so that makes me about three or four inches taller than the average Chilean man. And when I walk around, uh, people call me gringo, which is a neutral term in in Chile. Uh, and and also because I have a TV show a decent percentage of people know who I am. So some people call me by, by name. Now they call me Peter when I walk around. Um, right. and, and, and obviously I, you could tell by my hair and three earrings and my favorite colors, pink, I don't make any effort to fit in either in, in, in Chile. My wife's like, well, Peter, if you don't want to be mugged, you don't have to dress like that. And I said, well, yeah, well, it's, I'd, I'd rather be mugged than dress like everybody else. So my, my point was, and, and I forgot the word gringo from, from Westerns, uh, you're, still, you're a gringo, right? And mm-hmm. so you can speak the language, but does it take a while before, at least in your inner circles, they accept you at some point? So but my accent is very thick. And I'm really bad at languages. I'm very dys- dyslexic. The, 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 the course or the material that's been the hardest for me in my entire life has been anything with languages, anything with reading comprehension. So I stand out really bad for my accent. But I just, I'm, I'm pretty fearless. Uh, I was bullied. I'll take you back to a small, small kind of personal insight. I was born cross-eyed and I had surgery at the age of two, four, 10, 13, and 19. And I was bullied pretty heavily, probably till about the age of 11 for being very cross-eyed. And at some point I just accepted it and started telling everybody I was cross-eyed. And when I would walk up and meet people, I would make myself go cross-eyed on purpose and make some type of joke. And I think going through that makes me feel really comfortable speaking Spanish average subpar poorly. Um, and, and then to kind of to answer your question a little bit better, People in South America, in in Chile, are pretty pro-American in terms of kind of culture and the framework and the way that we approach life. Um, They 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 admire kind of our fearlessness and willingness to be individual and and stick out. So it allows you to be a little bit. It allows you to be a little bit, kind of the I don't I can't think of the English word right now, but it allows me to be a little bit more fluid in the class system, the social class system, the social economic class system, because in Chile, it's very strong. Um, But I can hang out with people who have helicopters and go to work in a jet as as easily as I can go to someone who, you know, uh, didn't finish, didn't finish middle school. Uh, And I can speak the middle school because the person, because I worked with the homeless, I can speak to the jet because I have blue eyes and I'm six foot tall. Um. So you, you, you were teaching international relations in, in, how did you wind up with entrepreneurship and marketing, especially? The, 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 this, is a, this is kind of one of those midlife um, answers, midlife crisis answers. I was 27 and I knew to make a decent living, I had to become a tenured professor. So I got a scholarship to study my PhD, started studying my PhD in political science. And about two years into my PhD, um, I developed a uh, uh, like a chronic illness and had a colon and they discovered that I had a tumor in my colon. And they thought I had intestinal tuberculosis after they determined that it was benign. And they thought that I'd gotten tuberculosis from working with the homeless population. And at that point, they said, we don't know what to do with this in Chile. We haven't had tuberculosis, in a long t- tuberculosis here in a long time. You should go back to the U.S. and see an expert. And I went back to the U.S. and bought a motorcycle, never went to a doctor, rode my motorcycle across the U.S. And when I moved back to Chile, I quit my Ph.D., uh, I quit working as a professor and started what I thought was going to be easiest thing for me to do, which would be show Americans why I love this country. So I started a bicycle tour company. I started a walking tour company, a wine tour company, a high-end luxury package tour company, and then also did golf tours. And uh, my customer service was great because I'm from the Midwest. Obviously, my English is fine. Um, and I knew I learned how to do marketing on the run with you know a bootstrap budget. And this was 2007. 
uh, yeah, 2007, when I started my first company, I was 27 years old, started my first website and I didn't know anything back then, but within six months after when you're spending your own money, as you probably know, Zev, you, you, you learn pretty quickly. So were your customers Americans or were they from all over the world? I would say the first couple of years, it was mostly Canadian, American, and a little bit of European. Uh, in the bicycle world, as uh, I became a little bit more diversified and understood marketing better, I say I picked up then the French, German, English, Australian. Uh, then when I got into walking tours and started doing a cool project, which is tip-based walking tours, so you don't pay for a tour until you're done, and then when you're done, you decide what you want to pay. That really just blew up, and from there, it just completely flopped, flipped, flopped the business model because I went from having high-end customers paying two hundred to a thousand dollars a day with me to backpackers who were giving me seven to fifteen dollar tips. But that doesn't really matter if you're moving a hundred to two hundred thousand people. Uh, doesn't really matter. I, I think that's a brilliant business model that most people will never do. But uh, ultimately, this is what it's about, right? You, if I give you value, tip me. If not, don't. Well, I saw, I saw on your website that you are on your LinkedIn that you don't uh, ask your clients to sign contracts. I, d I don't either. Right. Uh, and it's, it's kind of tip-based. Like, I'll perform. And, you know, if you want to walk away tomorrow, walk away tomorrow. And if you actually want me to work for two months and you're going to pay me late, you're going to stick me with two months of free work, but uh, it's the risk I run. I did it as a travel company, so I can do it in marketing. So I do it a little bit differently because they do pay me up front. Um, but if at any point during our engagement, they want to end, then we stop. I prorate whatever the balance of the month is, and I just write them a check, yeah. and that's it. There's no 20-page uh, there's no 20 -page legal document. There's no six-month commitment. Um I do it for two reasons. One, I don't want to give them a reason to say no, but but I also found that with with this kind of a, a basis for a collaboration, uh, it opens the door for people that tend to be less tense and relaxed and we get to work. And because I, I don't want to bore you about, I, every six months contract that I've seen in a coaching world was always pro coach, never pro customer. So if you want to bail out, the cost the client will have to prove that they've done all the work for them to get oh I, I, listen if if you're confident in what you do and you deliver value then that's it so um yeah fascinating stuff so um i have to ask the question because i i sometimes i ask it and and the answer is pretty interesting and if you don't want to go there that's okay but uh how'd you meet your wife how did she why who how did you meet the person that got you to actually settle down instead of running all over the world? Well, she would say that I haven't settled down. She'd probably say that my my the ants in my pants are actually moving more. Uh, my, but I love to tell this story. She's the most important person in my life. We met on a blind date in August of 2010. I was just about to quit uh, everything in academia. My travel company was taken off. I was going to dedicate myself full time to become an entrepreneur. She'd met me coming out of the tumor. She'd met me coming out of a broken hip on a from a severe motorcycle accident. And uh, I took her stupidly. I took her to a German restaurant in Santiago, Chile, when she's a vegetarian, and uh, she didn't eat a thing. Uh, it was pretty embarrassing. And then at least we went and danced. And my dancing skills were goofy enough that she remembered me. So I took her out on a second date the next day. And, and on our third date, um, we were riding our, my motorcycle through, through Santiago and we saw a whole bunch of people partying in the streets. And we pulled over and said, what are you partying? There's no soccer game today. What are you, what are you doing? And they said, the, the miners, they discovered the miners in the North part of Chile wow. and they're all alive. And a couple hours later, I got a phone call from ABC Nightline saying, hey, Peter, you worked with us during the big earthquake about a year ago. Will you pick us up at the will you pick us up at the airport tomorrow morning with the van for a month's supplies, pick up uh, our cameraman on our our video team and, and our sound team and and our camera and, and our face and our front woman uh, and take her up. And you guys need to be there within 12 hours to see them uh, rescue the miners. So uh, I, 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 I get from your question that it's hard to get me to settle down. She settled me down in the sense that 
Uh, I don't date anyone else. Uh, very monogamous. She settled me down and that I'm blessed to have an amazing kid, uh, but she can't stop me from traveling. And I think she enjoys the ride. <laughs> amazing. Um, and, 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 and you're lucky because when you have somebody who, who loves you for who you are and accepts you for who you are, as opposed to laying the law, the law down and saying, well, you can't do that anymore. Cause you know, you're a father. It's, it's great. Perfect. Um, so, all right, so now we get to the big reveal. How does uh, someone like you wind up with long-term care? That, like, this is like, to me, it's like, I think they used the word trampoline before. You like just jumped on the trampoline over some six-foot fence. How'd you wind up with that? So it's a unique story. So Chile went through some very violent civil unrest in October of 2019. And my wife and I and our three-year-old, we lived downtown Santiago, Chile, right next to the protests. And on the first night of the protests, uh, I went out right next to my office and I saw thousands of people jumping on a bridge that I thought was going to collapse. Uh, they burnt down more than 30 subway stations in one evening. And I thought they were going to burn down my office, steal 200 bicycles, uh, take all of my computers, our cash box, and I was going to be without a job. And I was worried. I was worried for personal security. And I bought on day three of those protests, still violent, uh, throwing Molotov bombs at the police, police shooting protesters. Uh, I called my business partner who was Chilean. He was in Argentina at the time. And I said, we need to close down the company. And I said, these protests are going to last uh, for for six months, a year, two years, three years. I was, I'd was i studied sociology in undergrad, studied my master's, my PhD in political science. I was very in tune with where this was going. And he came back to Chile on day four or five. He said, you're right. He said, uh, we're, we're closing, closing down the company. And as uh, soon as we closed it down, I told my wife, about 20 days later, I said, I, I, I can't live in the Chile that I love with what it's going through. It's just people are hateful. The right and the left are fighting over everything. I'm pretty independent. I'm pretty middle of the road, always have been for politics. And I said, I'm out of here. Uh, I said, uh, I'm taking our son to the US. You come follow as soon as you can rent out our apartment, sell our car, get rid of everything that you can. Um, and here's my power of attorney, do anything you need to do in my name. And my son and I moved back to the US because uh, I knew my travel companies weren't going to have a dollar of revenue within three weeks because no Americans were going to go to a country that had that amount of violence. And when I got back to the US, one of the first job opportunities I had, I was recruited by the CEO of a long-term care software company. Uh, his name's Jason Long. He's a, I consider him a friend now. He was an acquaintance there. We'd met through... An, an online community similar to Growth Mentor. It's called Dynamite Circle. And he, I, I remember his pitch. He goes, I need, I need a generalist who can, who can solve problems quickly, who knows how to hire and consult and uh, uh, oversee experts so we, we can grow and scale and rebrand. And uh, I need someone here to be to, with me to the end and going to be very loyal. And I said, I'm your man. I asked my wife, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to probably work 70 or 80 hours for the next six months trying to understand long-term care. I'm going to become a nurse's aide. I need to understand software. I need to know how to sell software that costs 50 to $150,000 a year, something I've never done. And she said, go for it. And that's how I got into long-term care and going on three years now. And it's been amazing. I love it. And so the, the software was for, for, Nursing homes. Nursing homes. Yeah. So it's electronic electronic healthcare records. Hmm. Interesting. But but so you got certified as a uh a CNA as a certified nurse's aide, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I did that. I did that for a couple different reasons. One is I started working in long-term care during COVID, and you can't go into nursing homes during COVID because of the risk. Uh, I did it secondly because the majority of the people who use our software, electronic healthcare records, are CNAs. And so I need to understand them. And then the third reason that I did it is because the biggest issue right now in long-term care is there's a huge staffing crisis. If there's a staffing crisis across the U.S., there's been a staffing crisis in long-term care for 15 years. The reimbursement rate that the U.S. gets 
from uh, the nursing homes get from the US government hasn't been adjusted in over a decade. So that means CNAs are almost getting paid the same amount that they were 10 years ago, or the owner's losing out if he's paying them more. So there's a staffing crisis. They're going to work in McDonald's or staying at home or going to Walmart. So what I did when I became a CNA, I documented the entire process to help combat the negative perception and show that while I might not be making the same amount that you might at a retail store, the human return on investment, the reward that you get from your heart and your soul is superior to anything else. Anything else. I mean, that's why I mentioned like when I told you the two best jobs I've ever done, you know, one was homeless caseworker and the other one was long-term care. Uh, I didn't say TV show host. I didn't say podcaster. I didn't say running my own company. I didn't say meeting Paul McCartney. It was two things where I, 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 I love through acts of service and get more back from the people I work for. So w- when I saw that, um, and this has nothing to do with software, but it has to do with the just the industry in general. I think anyone who's ever come into personal contact with any type of long-term care, so, I mean, in New York, nursing homes, same thing, right? Is, is it the same thing? Am I using, am I, or am yep, I? Yep. It is. Yeah, okay. you could, they're, they're interchangeable. Nursing homes, post-acute care, long-term care. Right. So anybody... Anyone that comes into contact through personal interactions, um, and in my case, it was um, my parents, but that was Israel, so it's different. But here, my father-in-law, um, initially when he had a heart attack and wind up in rehab, and a lot of the rehabs are inside the the nursing home facility. They have, a, I guess, a wing with their rehabilitate people, and they make more money, I'm assuming. Um mm-hmm. And then at some point when we officially moved him to a facility, um, I, I, I gotta tell you, I mean, m- my wife used to go home crying and uh, I used to go there a lot just to check on him. It is, it is frightening, especially if it's a loved one, like if it's your dad, mm-hmm. uh, it's heartbreaking to have to move him out of their home into a nursing facility. And we waited to the absolutely the last minute we could actually, we had somebody at home care for him for 24 hours, but then it just went beyond that. Uh, And then I would do surprise visits. I just come in and and go check on him. And uh, it's frightening, Peter. It's just frightening. And and I looked at, um, at, at the staff, Um, honestly, didn't see too many white people. I know it sounds terrible. Um, and when you think about the the type of work that they do, right? It's, I, I could never do it. I admit it. I could never do it. I mean, to go and, and clean someone. And, and it's it's really tough. You really have to have the, the willingness to serve at, at an incredibly high level to do that kind of work. To some extent, and it's completely different. My my young daughter is an ER nurse, um, and nurses on their own, I think, deserve a lot of respect and kudos. But the ER nurses, particularly, because she's been doing it for ten years, what they go through is insane. Is absolutely insane. Uh, mm-hmm. They get punched. They get thrown feces on. They, I mean, the good thing is they they get paid well. Okay, so we have to give them that. But but there are plenty of professions where you could get paid a lot of money, but if you if, if you hate your job, you're still not gonna do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the nursing staff, because they get paid minimum wage or a little bit more, I, I mean I I just I can't wrap my hand around why would anybody want to work in a long-term facility making the kind of money that they get paid under the conditions that they work mm-hmm. right it's <laughs> and and yes if you pay them more maybe you'll attract different people but um i don't know how you solve it because i, I mean we are worried for his well-being because there's not enough people there and i walked into one facility here and i on a surprise visit and he was sitting in the corner on a wheelchair and kept saying, I need to go to the bathroom, I need to go to the bathroom. And nobody was paying attention to him. Um, so I, I don't want to paint a, a depressing picture, but I think but I think it is, isn't it? 
I think it depends on where you are. So I would say, generally speaking, what you're saying in the direction that the country is going with long-term care is accurate. My experience is not similar to yours um, with the particulars. My my grandparents had Alzheimer's and their nursing home was amazing. Surprise visits were completely different than what you're saying. Um, and then where I was a CNA, uh, where I did my training, I never saw anything similar to uh, what you described with your father. Mm-hmm. What, where, so like, if my experience where I, where I became a CNA was a B plus, like the areas for improvement were probably we were understaffed by one or two CNAs for 30 or 40 residents. And then secondly is people are a little bit burnt out. So you have a little bit less interest of go of going the extra mile to take care of someone. If someone is under eating because they don't feel good or they have the flu or they're not taking enough fluids because, because they're, a little bit disoriented, you know, you're, you're not thinking of the extra way to coax them to get more water, which, which is dehydration is going to help with their, with their memory, uh, because they might be tired of burnout. But generally speaking, the people that I worked with their, their hearts were in the right place. And I wish you'd have had that experience. There are people that I would, I, I would feel very comfortable putting my parents in that nursing home facility if I couldn't take care of them at home. Okay. I just got back from a convention in Ohio and went to a facility and walked around and visited all of the CNAs and all of the frontline caregivers. And I said to the person, it was a drop-in surprise visit, the person who, who was taking me around as a friend of mine. And I told him, I said, I've never, ever been in a place like this. All of these people quit working for agencies, which means that they were traveling from one nursing home to another, making about five to seven dollars per hour more working for the agency. And they all came and worked for him because of his culture. Now, mm-hmm. he he is the minority. Um, that is probably one percent of America's nursing homes. But there there are ways to replicate what he's doing. We can't do it without the backing of the, the of the federal government. Yeah, and, and I think one way to do it at a at a ground level, we were always very generous and and went out of our way to thank the staff and support the staff and and you know sometimes bring them something uh and and appreciating what they've done. And I think you have mm-hmm. to do it. You you have to yep. do it. Um but my lesson from from long-term care is that if you're a family member, you have to be there and make sure that your your loved one is taken care of. Uh, not- I would I would agree with that, and I would add, you should be there if you're a human being. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So it's 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 not much it's not much different than when people complain about what they're le- learning at public school, and. I, I just say, well, I don't send my kid to school to be educated. Um, school is more about babysitting. What's important that he learns, he's going to learn from me and observing me and his mom. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. Yeah. Um, interesting. I spoke to one of my guests the other day, and and a very successful guy, and he said, I don't think anybody should go to college. It's a waste of time and money. Uh, go go get some practice. Go get some practical work. Go work ten jobs so you can get cross-section of different industries, different environment, cultures. And if you want to learn anything, just watch YouTube and watch TED and you'll be fine. You'll be okay. And you know what? I I think given the cost of education, uh, it's got something. Uh, I, I'm not saying- yeah, this I, is- yeah, this is kind of a half-baked idea. I've never said it out loud, so it might come off wrong. But I almost feel like you should have to take a test of common sense before you go to college and get yourself in debt for $100,000 to $80,000 or ten dollars to $80,000 before you quit. Because I would agree with, with your, with your guests that you should at least do a year or two year of working or volunteering or traveling abroad, because most of us, myself included, if you would have asked me at 18, why I'm going to college, I don't think my answers would pass the test that I'm proud of today. Yeah, you're right. And, and look, I came from, from a country where at 18, we go to serve in the military for three years because it's mandatory and that's what you do. And we all look forward so it's for serving. Um, then at, at 21, 22, I show up here and, and I go to college and I want to live on campus to experience American college life. And I see people that are younger than me, 18, 19, 20, who are just, they're just a party. You know, as I get, get drunk, have sex, whatever. Um, 
and I looked and I said, wow, this is, this is where the country where everybody says money grows on trees. Uh, well, I hope it is because I don't know. I don't see it here. Um, so, but back to long-term care, I, I think, uh, I think you're right. Everybody should be there. Uh, it's interesting. And, and I'll end with that. I'm going to jump into my rapid questions. Um, uh, I used to run my my team meetings in a company that I spend most of my career in the medical devices. We used to run a team meeting uh, every Friday at the end of the day, and people always complain about the phones are ringing. And you know, constantly I'm, I hang up and the phone rings again, and I do this and I do this. And I used to go back and forth because I travel overseas. I was able to see my parents every three to four months, and especially when they were in a nursing home. Uh, and I remember the shocking transformation that I saw with my dad going into an assisted living first and literally within three to four months, the, the deterioration from an independent guy to, and they move them to different floor depending on their independence. Uh, it, I, it was shocking to me. I was there every three months and I, and I saw other people, they all lived in a, they, had, they ate in a common uh, dining room. And you see people that were used to be vibrant and all of a sudden it, it was shocked. So I, when I had my team meeting, I remember saying to everybody that complained and I said, do yourself a favor. At some point this weekend, find a nursing home and please walk through the front door and just walk around. Okay. And take a peek at those rooms and understand this is like the preview. This is a coming attraction. Uh, and of course, a lot of them have that awful urine smell when you walk in, the ones that are not well cared of. I said, walk in, do yourself a favor, go do that. Walk around and look at the people sitting in the rooms. Um, mm -hmm. and, and if you talk to them and ask them what they're thinking about, they'll tell you what they regret that they haven't been able to do in life uh, most of the time. And I said, stop bitching about the phone ringing, okay? Appreciate what you have. Mm. I was at a on a similar kind of conversation about a year ago. I was at a entrepreneurial convention in Mexico, and one of my friends said to me, "We'd had a couple of drinks." And he says, "You know, my my partner wants to have a baby, and I don't think that I'm I I don't I don't think I I'm made of the material to be a good dad. Uh, I think I'm too egotistical. I think that I'm too young." Um, and I said. I'm really glad you're telling me this. Here's what I'm going to tell you. When when my wife told me she wanted to have a kid and I wasn't certain, uh, we went to a couple's therapist and the therapist told us to get a dog. I have a 2.0 version of that, which was um, go volunteer at a nursing home for two months every single Saturday. And if you're capable of caring for people that you don't have a close connection with yet, who can't express what's wrong with them, who can't say out loud when their stomach hurts or they have diarrhea, and it stresses you out when you can see discomfort in their face and it makes you want to work an extra day and you want to extend your time being a volunteer, you're cut to be a dad. Uh, because I think that it's made from the it's made from the same cloth. Wow. That's the, I, this is one of the most brilliant uh analogies i've i've ever heard really amazing um i didn't i didn't know it till i became a dad or till i worked in long-term care so i can't take credit for anything i just i was forced into learning it. yeah and by the way so so you you said you know doing a test a common sense test before you get admitted to college i would add there need to be some sort of a test before you become a parent uh, yeah, because there's no licensing exam. Like every every idiot can have sex and have a kid, and then you don't have a right to destroy a human being because you're an idiot, right? So, not going to happen. That's okay. So here we go. Ready, Peter? One word answers. Dr. Rapid fire. One person that influenced you the most. Doctor Holcomb. Okay, I don't know who he is. You could tell me who he is. Yeah, he was uh, my sociology professor in undergrad. He taught me that the world is not black and white. Um, he took his life in 2014, and he was the most influential person in my life outside of my father. Wow. Best advice you've ever received? From my mom. Um, I would say live your life 
Live your life like your dead grandma's watching you. <laughs> One book to change your life, fiction, nonfiction. Oh, this is so easy. I do talks on this. I think the first time you and I spoke, I told you that I was interested in doing keynote speeches around this. Five yeah. Languages of Love. I've gifted the book 20 times. I've read the book many times. I've given talks on it. Uh, it is fundamental. I think that you can flip a negative relationship by learning the the ways that a person wants to be loved or change the word in a work environment to feeling appreciated. Uh, it changed the way that I approached life. It saved my marriage. Um, and it's been a great tool for me teaching people who are burnt out in life on how they can make a difference. Well, if, if one of my listeners reads the book and it changes their life, then it's worth this podcast. Um, two more. If you had a billboard in Times Square, New York City, what would you put on it? Also, uh, something from my mom, and it is, you can, the only thing in life you can control is your attitude. And then I would put like a little dash behind it and say, Peter Murphy Lewis's mom. <laughs> All right. Last one. Since you gave Paul McCartney and Steven Tyler tours in Chile, uh, what song would you admit to secretly singing in the shower? Oh, man. Uh, I would probably say Aerosmith's song, Amazing. And I sang parts of that song when I ran an ultra marathon at the age of 40 in the summer in Oklahoma. Um, what, and so what? when Steven Tyler... When Steven oh. Tyler came into my office in South America, um, I was I was amazed. There was a person who took off their shirt and asked him to sign his chest with a permanent marker. And so I'll 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 forever sing "Amazing" uh, because of 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 how great and how important Aerosmith was in my life when I was growing up in high school. What well, what's an ultra marathon? Is that bigger than twenty six? Yeah, it's bigger than twenty six. So I had a I had a goal to run a marathon be before I turned forty, and I did it by about eleven days. And then about right after I finished that, I won that marathon. Uh, when I, about two days later, when I was no longer sore, I told my wife that I signed up for an ultra marathon, which was 50 miles. And I did that about three months later and won that. All right. I didn't plan on asking this and we'll keep it short, but um, all of us are really good at setting goals. Like you said, marathon before 40. And and we know how that ends, right? You and and marathon again. I'm not a runner, and never liked running, but I know some people that did the marathon. You have to build up, right? So it's about discipline, and and most people just fall apart, right? It sounds good. They they start the process, they tell all the friends, and then at some point, it goes away. What's your what is the biggest advice you can give someone about goal setting and actually doing it? The simple answer is find a way to enjoy the process. Mm -hmm. So specifically with the the marathon and the ultra marathon, I'd heard my wife say over and over again, it's hard for you to be silent, Peter. It's hard for you to be in a room without music on or listen to a podcast. So I forced myself to train for my ultra marathon on a high school track of 400 meters and without music. And I had a mantra that I sang to myself, which was survive, thrive, high five. I'd survived a lot of things that have happened in my life. I decided that I was going to thrive and now I can celebrate it. High five. So I learned to enjoy the process. And when I finished the ultra marathon, I didn't feel like I had to do something else because I enjoyed the process so much. I was just going to apply that process of enjoyment to something new in my life. Yeah. Again, I think that's brilliant. And and I'm thinking about things that I fell apart on. I got bored with, I didn't have the, I didn't enjoy it. So I got bored with it. And it's probably why diets fail because people just, just fell fall off the wagon or anything else. Um, Peter, this was amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to make it to South America. I got, I have to go. Um, but now I have a tour guide. Maybe we'll see. Yeah, come on down. I I do make it to New York uh, once or twice a year, so I'll look you up when I'm there oh. and take you out, take you take you out for beer, or dinner, or pizza. No, I think I'm going to do it the other way around. But just let me know and I'll take you out. Thank you so much, uh, Seth. Thanks. Been awesome.